This is Glambition Radio, episode number 266, Brave Homeschooling with Julie Bogart. Ladies and gentlemen. Glambition Radio. Glambition Radio. Glambition Radio. Glambition Radio. Glambition Radio. Glambition Radio. Welcome to Glambition Radio. I am your host, Allie Brown. I'm an entrepreneur, mentor, investor, and founder of The Trust, the modern premier network for seven and eight figure women leaders. I love thinking big, doing different, and exploring ideas that disrupt the status quo, especially when it comes to women, because we are creating the new models for leadership, business success, making money, and changing the world. And hey, we're doing it with style. So let's go. Hi there. My family and I are back from the beach. We decided to squeeze in one more trip to California while the weather was fantastic there. And uh, we just had a wonderful time. Just such magical summers right now with the kids at this age. The twins are eight and you know, we could do this last trip too, because we were homeschooling. And if you've heard me talk about this before, you know, this has been such a pivotal part of my personal journey over this past year and a way that I saw the magic amid a lot of the negativity and terrible things really happening in the world is discovering the beauty of some of the things we were kind of forced into. And now we're doing things in our own way. So these things we may have never expected, these things we may have never seen coming that we wouldn't have put on a vision board. Homeschooling was not on my vision board. Let me make that clear. It has landed in our laps in this flow, way, this, this, this way of grace. It's pretty extraordinary. So I love talking about this. and. I was so excited that we got one of the most influential women in my personal life around this topic on the show. I'm like, I wonder if Julie Bogart would join us. And some of you may be like, who is Julie Bogart? In the homeschool world, she's an absolute rock star. And she was someone who I really related to. She seemed to approach this stuff with a real common sense, like very matter of fact. She didn't judge people for doing things one way or the other. And here's my thing, ladies, there's not one right way to do this. We are creating the new models. We are creating this for the future of our children and ourselves. So I hope you find this really, really inspiring. Uh, Man, as she had a year too, her membership grew once 2020 hit from 600 to over 10,000. Can you imagine the infrastructure changes and the hiring she had to do? I mean, it was good problems to have, right? But really, things just got crazy. You're going to love the business side of this as well, that she catapulted her business into the multiple seven figures, knowing that she's helping also thousands of women around the globe really know how to do this, but in a way that is really magical. And um, you're going to love this conversation. I want to give a quick shout out to two great reviews my team pulled for me from Apple Podcasts. The first is Tina from Burlington in Canada. Gave this five stars. Thank you. Allie's conversations will give you insight you need to make the right decision. There have been so many moments where I wanted to give up and her podcast has helped me get back on track and realize my struggles are not novel. It's all about how you work through them. The stories that are shared in this podcast will take you to the next level. And then NJ Zapala from the U.S., commented specifically on the episode with uh, Sarah Fry. If you haven't heard that one, episode 223, uh, we did a replay. It was so good. It got so much feedback. She is like the pumpkin queen of the country. But the man, the story about her upbringing and the decisions she made and the changes she did and just incredible. So anyway, let me let NJ Sapala rave about it. Oh my God, this episode was fabulous. Getting ahead sometimes means staying behind. Sarah's words shook me to my core. And when she said, I created a lifestyle, not a business, thousand percent, yes. This theory should be taught at universities around the globe. Thanks, Allie, for an insightful behind the scenes look at another successful woman owned business. Can't wait to listen to the next one. 
Now, you know, today's episode ties in so nicely with many of the conversations I've been having behind the scenes with my own private clients, with members of the trust, jointhetrust.org. That's our network for seven and eight figure women entrepreneurs, and also the women who are going to be joining me at Iconic, which is my one-time event I'm having November 3rd and 4th. If you like these discussions around reinvention, around new ways of thinking, around applying incredible new missions and visions to the business you already have, or time to reinvent a whole new one, this is the room you need to be in. You hear my conviction around this. I can't emphasize it strongly enough. There is not another room like this. There is a reason that the women I attract come to these events often again and again and say, this was exactly what I needed. I'm going out the door with a different mind. I am unstoppable. I'm full of conviction. And I'm so clear on the gifts I'm bringing to the world, as well as how I'm going to do this with this incredible network of women, Allie, that you've introduced me to. And these women are at higher levels. Now, iconic, I want to emphasize, because we do get questions, people may not realize you don't have to be at seven figures to come to iconic. But we are looking for those women who are not beginners that have uh, been through a few years of business, they've reached a certain level, and now they're looking, what is that next chapter for me? in this incredible new time. Iconic with AllieBrown.com will get you through to the information and you can apply to join us. We would love to see you. Iconic with AllieBrown.com, November 3rd and 4th here in Phoenix. Now get ready for a powerful conversation on the future of our children with Julie Bogart. Julie, I would like to know where you are right now? I'm actually sitting in my mother's office in Watsonville, California. I'm based out of Cincinnati, Ohio, but I'm here this week to attend to some things that she needs. And my mother, ironically, is my inspiration for everything. She herself was a self-starting freelance writer and author and has supported herself through writing and teaching writing her entire career. She has 70 published books to her name. Yes. That's like one a year of your life, like exactly from when you're <laughs> ten or I don't know. <laughs> I mean, right? She's eighty three, and wow. she didn't start writing until she was almost forty. So think about that. Oh my gosh, I feel like we need a three part interview. But here's <laughs> here's I I I want to share. Oh my god, there's so many places I want to go today. But but we're gonna have a we're gonna have a framework here, and you know where I'd love to dive in, where I get so fired up right now is about all the parents now waking up to the possibility of homeschooling. And I'll I'll share a bit about the quick story of my journey, which I kind of alluded to when we did the pre-chat is that, you know, I, I run a business, I have a life. I never questioned the kids going to school. And then, then 2020 happened, which was an interesting year, which got so many of us, the exciting thing was we started to look at everything and go, you know what? This never, we tolerated it, right? Like we, 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 it was just what you did and you would send them out the door and breathe a sigh of relief and then get to what you really need to do with your day. And then there was this disruption in this incredible way was, it was crazy and inconvenient and messy and led us to these places of magic that, (sighs) homeschooling for me has, I'm going to cry. Homeschooling for me has become. So I didn't know this would happen, but I'm so excited about this. It's not uncommon. Yes. It's not uncommon because really what I advocate for is parent participation in education. So homeschooling is sort of the far end of that extreme, right? Like truly staying home and attending to who your children are and building those traditions, connections, memories, and, you know, the same kind of joy you had when your child took their first steps. Now you see it when they learn to read or when they come running to you and share how they beat a level in a computer game. And you see the fruition of dedication and their desire, right? That is what homeschooling provides. 
What was fascinating last year in particular is that the reputation of homeschooling until 2020 was that it was this offstage, weird, kind of funny I thought of the Duggars, to be frank. Yes, of course (laughs) you did. They were the most notable and also the most strange. And honestly, homeschooling had this reputation. My book, The Brave Learner, came out in 2019. And when I would go on the radio tour for the book, the DJs frequently would say things to me like, Well, how do you handle socialization? And are you even qualified to teach your child? And what about the prom? You know, these very standard judgmental style questions. A year later, my book in 2020 got sent out to radio shows again because of COVID. And suddenly the interviewers all had kids sitting on the floor behind them, right? (laughs) Like the NPR host, the ESPN host, all these DJs were at home broadcasting from home and they were in talk show hosts. And they would say to me the most amazing, different kind of question. And my favorite one came from a guy who was a morning show talk show guy. And he said, Julie, we don't know what to do about socialization you've been homeschooling all these years. We figure you must be experts. And I almost dropped the phone. I just started laughing. I said, okay, no one has ever accused a homeschooler of being an expert in socialization. Like (laughs) (laughs) this is groundbreaking. And so I think what happened last year is that everyone had what I would call an encounter with homeschool, not just reading about it, not just the experience of watching it on TV, But they were brought face to face with being responsible for providing their children with good social experiences, with reading, with continuing their math, with talking about science, especially related to the disease in our bodies. Suddenly, parents were participating in their children's education at a level they didn't know would be valuable. Mm -hmm. And I think for some parents, that just became like for you this revolution of understanding of how powerful that relationship could actually be. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. And then, and then you step back and kind of look at, uh, it's, it's, it's such a heavy time, but exciting as well. You have so many parents now realizing, I, I think part of, part of that joy, to be honest, and I'm going to flip back to the joy of, of the send off yes. in the morning to be yes. afraid. Let's be afraid. Yes, I, I yes. often call. I, I I'll warn them. Some days I'm like, I could drop you off at a bus stop tomorrow. Better put pull your you know pull yourselves together. <laughs> it it was an, a bit of an abdication of responsibility, and yes. that was a bit of relief, wasn't it? Because that's where they would get the socialization. That's where you'd be sure. Well, you know what? Everything's going to hell here. At least maybe they'll be learning what they're supposed to. Right. A hundred percent. And I think that's the biggest anxiety parents have before they make the decision, particularly if they make the decision after their kids have already been in school for a number of years. So if you make the decision before kindergarten, that experience happens gradually. You don't feel the impact of that feeling until maybe third or fourth grade. But if your kids have been in school and you're used to that system, then your brain kind of gets conditioned by the public school expectations, by the fact that you are not the primary person who is responsible. But I will tell you this, this is really funny. I joined a group of women to train for a marathon back in 2009, 2010. And none of them were homeschoolers. I was the anomaly. I was the weirdo. So we would go running. There were five of them and me. And they spent the majority of our runs talking about how to game the system at their kids' high schools. It was fascinating to me, like how to get the class that you really want your kid to have, Mm. showing up to parent-teacher conferences, even if your child was getting an A, so the teacher would know you cared so that if there was a borderline between A minus B plus, they would have to lean towards A minus. Like they had so much investment in trying to get the school to be the thing they wanted. And I was just running alongside thinking, wow. I just read Emma with my daughter at bedtime. I serve poetry up with tea and cookies. (laughs) We go on nature walks. Like I didn't have any of that sort of gamesmanship going on in education. And so for me, that was a real revelation of kind of the different worlds, the one I had opted out of. Yeah. Yeah. So so when you saw 2020 happen and you saw some people kind of starting to wake up and what were your thoughts? Did you see it right away? You're like, oh, this is going to be interesting. Yes. In fact, I told my team, so my company, just for those who don't know it, 
We're 21 years old now. So we started in January of 2000. It was just me. Now I have a team of over 50. And in the beginning of 2019, we saw our 20th anniversary coming in 2020. So we prepared a huge offer. We started getting our branding together. We were going to celebrate the year all year, you know, totally unaware of what 2020 was going to be. But what happened is all that preparation just was accelerated by the pandemic. And the moment that we heard that a lockdown was coming, I reached out to a colleague of mine in the homeschool space and I said, hey, Susan, I think we need to address all these parents who are suddenly going to be at home. Let's do a free conference. We called it Homebound. And mm -hmm. we went ahead, you know, lots of double entendres there were mm -hmm. word people. And we invited experts and people that we knew would be valuable as a resource to our audience. And we made it free. And it was a week long. And it was the highest attendance that we've ever had for any webinars. Our webinars drew well over a thousand, sometimes over 2000 people for that whole week. Because literally everyone was home. <laughs> Nobody yeah. had ballet practice, soccer practice. They had nowhere to go. And they were all desperate. And so that really launched the year. Our revenue doubled last year. And we scrambled. We had to hire new people. We developed new products. We saw huge growth. Our membership community went from 600 people to 10,000 in a year. So mm -hmm. absolutely the interest in home education exploded and we were fortunately quite ready for it, which yeah. was, you know, one of the things about being a business, you plan, and then you get this accelerator. <laughs> right. Oh my God. I'm sure like, I'm just imagining behind the scenes, you're like, we need a better platform, change the web host, you know? Like, oh my God. It was stuff. so funny. In fact, yeah. I always think of Jaws where he says, you need a bigger boat, yep. you know? And interestingly, right now, I'm getting lots of direct messages from people like you who started homeschooling during the pandemic, some unlike you who've put their kids back in school and are thanking me for the revolution and how they understand their role in their mm. children's lives. Yeah. I pulled one up because it was so sweet. This mom said, today, the brave learner is me. 10,000 rounds of applause to you for launching your rescue boat into the deep when a pandemic created a tempest and public school parents all over the world started sinking. You scooped us all up into your boat and said, you've got this. There's room for you here. Welcome aboard. Mm. And you know, there was at the same time, Allie, a counter move happening among homeschoolers who felt threatened by the swarming of public school parents. In the homeschool oh, space, that's interesting. They, we, oh, yes. We have been trained to be suspicious of public school administrations, of teachers, of the system, because we're worried that our right to homeschool will be taken away. I actually don't have that worry anymore. I think it's way too big, too much of a juggernaut now. I think it's here to stay. But parents have those worries. So then what started happening is these public school parents started showing up in Facebook groups, Instagram accounts, joining membership communities. And their questions were all public school centered, like, well, how do I know that if I use your program, they'll be ready to go back to school in a year, right, right? Right. And so a lot of these homeschoolers felt threatened. So they started labeling people like you COVID schoolers. And I read countless messages of COVID schooling is not homeschooling. That was going on well, this also. This is interesting. In every subculture, then there's like a ripple and then they, they identify each other and categorize each other. It's just oh my human gosh. nature, isn't it? Oh, it is. Oh, it, and it's awful. And honestly, from the beginning of Brave Writer, and my staff knows this well, and it has been a plank in our identity, I refuse to vilify any form of education. I always say that all forms of education have value and parent participation in any of them improves them. Wow. So for us, it's a continuum. It's if you're a parent who had a baby, how can we help you get the best education for your child? Because frankly, there are some homes that are so dysfunctional, public school would be really an asset. Mm -hmm. There are some children who really need a different kind of structure or maybe even as my son Jacob in 10th grade told me, he wanted the competition. He wanted to go to public high school so he could compete. That was his temperament. Mm. This is the kid who went on to get a full ride scholarship to Columbia Law School. Clearly that was his temperament. So when we look at education, the goal is to suit it to the child 
and then as a parent, participate wholeheartedly to the full extent that you can. It is not to say there is one method of education that's right for everyone and I'm going to champion the cause and die doing it, right? That's not my philosophy. Yeah. We were ready for you. We were excited for all of you to join. It was not a threat to us in any way. Where did this, and by the way, I'm going to press pause on that for a second because I want everyone to take this in. And this is one of the things I loved about you so much when I started listening to you, Julie, was that I think women need to all understand there's not one best way to do this. Mm. We are all figuring out this together for ourselves, for our children, for our families. And if there's just something that I think we can all come together on, it's like mothers and, and, and fathers doing what's best for their kids and families. And that's what I love about, you know, your position how you teach, what you share. Now, I do want to jump back for a minute, though. Where did all this passion come from? You mentioned your mom, but you know, over the years, like, when did you realize, you know, I'm going to start sharing. I'm doing something right. I want to share with these other parents what I'm doing, and maybe it'll help. Gosh, what a nice way to put that question. I learned about homeschooling before I was even married. So the man that I was dating at the time had a friend who was older and he was homeschooling his kids. This was 1984. And he said to me something like, so are you going to homeschool your kids? I wasn't even engaged. <laughs> so I wasn't thinking about children. <laughs> well, and and I said, homeschool? What, what is that? I had never even heard those two words merged together in my life. So he started describing, you know, how to avoid the hostile communist takeover of our government by homeschooling our children. Like that was his <laughs> original. He was ahead of his time, apparently. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. <laughs> well, you know, he was kind of in that very conservative <laughs> Christian space, and that was very popular there. But then he started describing this tailor-made education. And what was really interesting to me, and, and ironic, people almost don't believe this, But what he described reminded me of my public school experience. I grew up in Los Angeles and was a part of a school district outside of Los Angeles called the Las Virginas School District. I was raised in the 60s and 70s, and my teachers were all flower power hippies, literally. They were the first generation of the Peace Corps. They were intoxicated with the new math and brand new ways of teaching English and writing and mixed classrooms and projects. I had a science class where we spent a month sitting next to a creek, each child finding their own space and learning every bug, plant, and animal in that space and drawing it. We did an entire Renaissance fair. I had a teacher take us on an archaeological dig that we created. Like we built the pots ourselves, smashed them, she buried them, then we dug them up. Like I had these very creative teachers And I had noticed in the ensuing years that education had taken this big turn. You know, it was starting to be no child left behind, very test-based, not project-centered. So as this man described homeschooling to me, I was like, oh, oh my gosh, I could do the schooling I had for my children. So I caught the vision right away. And by the time I had kids, I was living in the States. We had been overseas at the time and we were back in the States and uh, my neighbor was a homeschooler. And she and I forged this friendship and did so much together. And I just really saw the value of it. So fast forward a couple more years, I was working in my career as a freelance writer. I'm a ghost writer, a magazine editor. I was doing all those kinds of things on the side. And one of my homeschool friends said to me, I'm struggling to teach writing to my kids. You seem to be a professional writer. How are you teaching it? So I asked to see her curriculum because I wasn't using any. I knew how to teach writing naturally. And I opened the book and there was a sample paragraph to teach students how to write a paragraph. I read the paragraph and I said to my friend, Glenda, did you read this paragraph? She said, yes. I said, did you like what you read? And she said, what do you mean? I said, well, when you got to the end of the sample model paragraph, did you think to yourself, gosh, I wish there were a second paragraph. And she said, no, I can't even remember what it is. And I just gently closed the book and I said, why would you teach writing with a sample paragraph so dull you don't even remember it? Is that how you want your kids to write? Mm. And for her, the light went on and she said, can you teach us? Can we get a group together and you teach us how to write? 
So we, we actually booked a Sunday school class. I was active in a church back then. And the first week had 15 people. And by the seventh week, we had 40 mm -hmm. school teachers, parents, all kinds of adults. And it, they acted as though I was telling them things they had never heard. And for me, they were the most obvious things writers knew about writing mm -hmm. because I grew up with a professional writer. And so suddenly it became clear to me, wow, there's a market here to help parents understand the writing process, what's going on inside their children's minds, how their bodies behave, what they need in order to feel safe for writing risks, not just here is the structure of a paragraph and now let's argue about making you do it, right? So that really was all kind of late 90s and I launched in 2000. Wow. And explain to everyone how, please also share, where should people go to learn more about you before we go on, you know, Oh, sure. A bit about your programs, you know, and, and why they are and were, you know, they continue to be so different. Yeah. So the name of my company is Brave Writer, W R I T E R dot com. And interestingly, that name even came to me in the middle of a speaking engagement. I had launched the company under a different name. And six months later, I got invited to speak at a statewide homeschool convention. And I was speaking and I was very passionate. I said, we want free writers. We want brave writers. And the second the words came out of my mouth, I went home and told my husband, we've got to reroute the website and buy this URL mm -hmm. and start over, you know. But here's why. What I was realizing as I was teaching, and this would have been, you know, like June of 2000, I was realizing very quickly that what parents lacked was the self-confidence to trust the original writing voices of their children. They had been so conditioned to believe that accurate mechanics represented good writing, and they forgot that actually they never thought about mechanics when they read writing as adults. You know, when was the last time you read a book and told your friend, you got to read this book? the comma usage is superb, mm -hmm. right? Like that's, that's not what we do. And so my task became helping parents overcome their conditioning so that they could start valuing the quirky, original, insightful voices of their children and helping them to get some of that into writing. And amazingly, the moment parents make that connection, and I have a tool I can share on this podcast if you want, that's very mm -hmm. easy for them to use. But once they make that connection, it transforms everything about writing for the parent and especially for the child. Mm. Yeah. What is the tool? Do you want to share that? Yeah, happy to. So what I recommend with parents, no matter how old your child is, it could be a four-year-old who doesn't read or write yet or a 16-year-old who hates writing. So any age range, if you have a child who isn't writing yet or hates writing, here's what you do. You wait for a moment of spontaneous self-expression orally. It usually happens at the most inconvenient time. You'll be bathing, you'll be making dinner, you'll be driving to the dentist, and suddenly you'll notice an eruption of speech. And of course, it's always about things that you don't care about. Pokemon, the video game, the dog chasing the squirrel in the backyard, right? <laughs> like it's, mm -hmm. it's whatever is animating them in the moment. And when you notice that rush of speech coming, what I want you to do is this. Grab a scratch sheet of paper, the back of an envelope, whatever's handy, and a pen, and without saying a word, start writing down their exact wording, whatever mm -hmm. they're saying to you. We call this the jot it down practice. Now, some kids will be like, mommy, mommy, what are you doing? What I want you to say back is, this is so good, I'm afraid I'm going to forget it. So I'm just jotting it down. Keep going. Now, with tons of kids. They square their little shoulders and they give you 10 more minutes, right? <laughs> and you're going to wear out your hand trying to write down what they say. For kids who say, I don't want you to write it down. You stop, you listen. And when they leave, you jot down as much as you can remember, as close to how they told it to you as you can approximate. That night at dinner, I want you to just pull out that piece of writing and in front of the family say, you know, Janie was telling me about how Rocky chased the squirrel in the backyard. It was so good. I didn't want to forget it. So I wrote it down. I just want to read it to everybody. Let your child hear you value and read their words that are now preserved on paper to an interested audience. 
and then talk about the content. Well, then what happened? Did Rocky ever get the squirrel? Was the squirrel scared? You know, have a conversation. Later, take that writing, toss it in the library book basket if it's a small child. And then as you read aloud each day, pull out that writing again and say, oh, let's see what author Janie had to say. Let them discover the pleasure of being read. Mm. Children don't know when you ask them to write that what lives inside of them is what you want to see on the paper. They don't know that when they get it to the paper, it could be enjoyed on its own merits, regardless of spelling, grammar, and punctuation. And for your teens, obviously, they're not going to be excited about telling you a little story. You're going to wait until you're in an argument. When the teen is begging you to play a first person shooter or, you know, buy that paintball gun or whatever it is, Mm -hmm. your daughter who wants to travel to Europe at age 15 and travel by herself, right? Like whatever that thing is, wait for that and start writing down their reasons for their belief or their argument. And when they ask you, you know, what are you doing? Saying, look, I, I want to take this seriously. Keep going. I need to actually read these and review these and think about them. So keep going. Value what's coming out of your children. Get some of it in writing. Read it back to them later. Take it seriously. And you will grow a writer. Mm, I love all that. I just, I just love the, I know for me, it just brought back the magic that I loved about writing when I was younger. Mm. And that led to me being that my writing, my writing carried my whole career and I didn't know it. You know, it really yes. is still the number one skill I would say like that gives me just, just a different edge on the world and a different way to view the world and way to value my words and, and my thoughts. And uh, Julie, where do you think this is all going? <laughs> <laughs> the, the future of, of homeschool, not, not you particularly, sorry, but you yes. know, when you step back now and look at the state of the world, the state of education here, you know, what, what are your observations and predictions on, on what's happening? I think I would say this. Education has to undergo a revolution. I have a book coming out called Raising Critical Thinkers. It comes out in February. Mm. And I talked a little bit about the effectiveness of public education. You know, really, it's got a long history. But starting with the Industrial Revolution in particular, the idea of educating everyone, whether they were royalty or the muckety-mucks who worked for royalty, you know, that has resulted in this explosive, amazing world that we all share. Absolutely. But the mechanization of education, we've outlived it. And the problems we're facing that we need to solve in the future require innovators and creative thinkers. And that requires risk and opportunity for failure and not only precision of measurement. And so in my view, homeschooling has acted as a critique you know, a little bit of, of, of a fly in the ointment. We're saying there are more ways to get an education than testing. There are values and ethics and creativity that need to be cultivated in our learners, not merely output that matches the expectations of an instructor. Some of my favorite education reformers, Bell Hooks, Paolo Freire, even Peter Elbow, they are challenging the status quo and homeschooling is a status quo challenging movement. And so in my view, we want to give as much space as possible to as many models as possible Mm. so that we can start to reinvent what education looks like and confront the challenges that face us in the next century. I I love this. And it's, it's such an exciting time. I mean, in, in the grand perspective, but also I'm going to just talk about the entrepreneurial perspective because, you know, I, yes. I, I work with almost exclusively women who have built businesses into the seven and eight figures. Yes. And we have these rooms and we have these discussions. And it's really interesting that, you know, we've, we've all been liberated now to work at home. We have so many opportunities, but we just wouldn't let go of that educational model, right? This was the last domino that needed to fall. And, and here we are now having these discussions on how many of them now have the freedom to travel. 
Yes. Because their husband's working at home too. And then the husband's saying, well, I want to work at home, you know, for your business. And so we have such dramatic makeovers over the last year, like husbands leaving their corporate jobs to work for their wives at home. And now the kids are home and they're like, well, hey, let's go on the road and live in a camper van or, you know, like, yes, education was the last thing we kind of just wouldn't, I don't know, we didn't want to mess with it. Right. Because there was, there's been a lot of change in our generation for women. A hundred percent. And I, boy, you just, I hope you don't mind me. I I have got to jump in here because this is really interesting to me. So one of the things I say to homeschooling mothers in particular all the time is that they are entrepreneurs. They are educational entrepreneurs. They are building a curriculum from scratch. They are tailoring what they produce to the needs of their customers, their children. They are designing a, you know, 10-year plan. They have entrepreneurial energy. And so to imagine an entrepreneur going in the reverse order to home education they have the tools and skills they need to design education. Like they don't have to be afraid of it. Just yeah. like they chose not to work in a corporation and could design and invent something from scratch, an entrepreneur can do the same thing for education. The second thing I'll say is this I've been an entrepreneur without ever having worked in a company. I've never been on a job interview. I've never worked for a company. I don't have an MBA. My degrees are in history and theology. I was a freelance writer, not even like an established author. And I worked behind the scenes doing ghostwriting and editing and copy editing. So how in the world do I have a company? How do I have a a seven-figure company under those conditions? And I think it's because I followed both my insight Mm. and the way that I built the community and I watched the trends and I really paid attention to the zeitgeist. And then I added in these other skills. But let me just say this, the biggest disappointment to me in becoming a business owner over these 20 years is that whenever I read a business book, it is very much modeled after men Mm -hmm. and their aspirations and their ambitions. And I don't share them. Like the money is the least interesting part of my company. Selling and making a ton of money, couldn't care less about that. I actually care about the legacy of the ideas that my team has created over 20 years of research and investment in a field. I'm more like an academic (laughs) who happens to make Mm. money. And so I just want to invite women in particular to revolutionize business the way we have education. Because frankly, I'm fed up with the male business model. I don't get it. It doesn't resonate with me. Yes, I have to learn professional management skills. I do know that. But the objectives are such a mismatch for how I think about living and contribution. We are pioneering the new models. I hope so. I think we are. I think women need to. And I look forward to writing that book someday when I have more to say about it. But I, I really am eager you know, on every level, let's get more women doing stuff because we bring a different energy. Don't get seduced by men. In other words, don't let men decide for you. Totally. Well, when you think about you know, that past, the, the, the industrial revolution led us to, you know, everything yes. had the, the, the formulas and yes. this is how we do things. And it's very prescriptive, right? Yes. And now we're moving into this time and I'm going to get a little meta here, but you know, with the human collective is undergoing a tremendous transformation. There's Truly. so much energy shifts on the world. And we are now working from and what women have always done well, if they tap into it, we're working from an intuitive place. That's right. And, and this just goes with that. And, and man, I had to relearn it for this though, because this was the last place that, oh man, we question ourselves as moms, right? Well, am I doing this right? Are they going to end up on the street one day? <laughs> you know, we just, right. the 2 a.m., right. like, what if they don't know how to write a certain way or are they on track with math? But it's interesting though, Julie, like after about a year now, I feel so unplugged kind of from the matrix. I love it. I'm just so tuned in to where they are and bettering their best and not worrying about what's going on. It's, 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 it's this beautiful piece behind it. If you allow it. And isn't that what we're all craving? Like a lot of us move home, you know, there's a real shortage right now of finding employees because so many of them are looking for these at home jobs. It speaks Mm -hmm. to just how brutal the lifestyle was that we were all living under with the illusion that it was the only way we could ever do it, right? So there is this 
And I think that's what happens to people when they start homeschooling. Yes, we all reinvent public school on the first day. We sit at a table. We open the workbook. We start at 9 a.m., right? But within a year, we're like, oh, my gosh, I live in a home. Like, I can pee when I want to. I can get a snack if I need one. I can take a nap at 11 because I'm pregnant. Totally. You know, these are humane structures that we're trying to create and leave it to women to care about our humanity. Yeah. That has been our task assigned by men. Well, look out, men. If we come into the business space, it's going to be humane. If we come into the education space, it's going to be humane because we've been cultivating those skills for millennia. I love that. Julie, last words of advice. Could you share three pieces of your wisdom with all the women listening? Gosh, fun. Okay. So the first thing that I care the most about is not getting it right, but generating insight. So the temptation to always have the right answer is a function of multiple choice testing in school. But what advances anything is breakthrough insight. So when you're faced with a dilemma, don't try to figure out which is the right thing. Generate as many takes as you possibly can and allow them to percolate and see what new thing emerges the third way, the eighth way like that. Mm -hmm. So that'd be my first one. Secondly, if you are an entrepreneur, I think building your customer base, in my case, I'm in the influencer space more, you know, because of the way social media functions for our company, but building a following that is a community as opposed to customers to me is the key to really creating something of value for everyone. If they know they can access you and have meaningful, humane contact, they will value your services so much more. And then the third thing I would say really is about family. I know for me, I've been divorced. I have five children who are all adults living all over the world. And despite any challenges we've faced, we've all worked to continue to find our way to each other and to keep establishing bonds that are meaningful. And homeschooling provided that foundation. Mm -hmm. And even my ex-husband and I are on good terms. We had a, a family vacation last month And both my boyfriend and my ex-husband and my kids, we were all there together. And I feel like that's not always possible, but I do feel like the safe harbor in the storm needs to be those people that have your back. And so investing in them is always a good idea over business, over anything else. Yeah. I love this. Julie, thank you so much. Can you give your website one more time? Yes. It's bravewriter.com. And I'll mention the new book again one more time, Raising Critical Thinkers. I cannot wait for that one. Maybe we'll have to have you back for a whole discussion on that. I'd love to come back. That'd be fun. Okay, great. Thanks, Julie. Thank you, Allie, so much. Bye. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Glambition Radio. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you subscribe so you automatically get my new shows every week. Also, I'd love if you left us a review so more women like you can discover us. We're on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Pandora, and other major platforms. And I'd love to hear from you personally. Come join the conversation on social. Instagram is my happy place lately, and that's Allie Brown Official. But you can find links to my other platforms at AllieBrown.com. Glambition Radio is the elevated conversation for women leaders, and I'm honored you tuned in. 